Hours into the expedition, you're the last of your team alive and pinned in the dark heart of an Antarctic storm. Out of hope, you feel death watching from the white. But just then, you hear a voice, unknown yet strangely familiar, guiding you from the dark. But when the winds settle, you find yourself once again alone. Your will to survive has returned, but the stranger is gone. Or was he ever there at all? For at least 100 years, there have been documented cases of those on the brink of life and death experiencing the presence of a guiding phantom inexplicably manifesting from somewhere beyond. Adventure with us to the ends of the earth in the pursuit of this mysterious companion in an attempt to explain the third man factor. Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. Jury, in. close your door. What's the uh, inner Earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman, Bohemian Grove, Corey Feld, Magicians are demons, Specters, and Spirit spooks. Summonings, Paralysis, Strange Disappearance, Sky Whale Phenomenon, yes. Alternative History, Shadow People. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf Towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic Catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. Hey. Hello, hello, gentlemen. Welcome to be here. I'm Chris. I am John. And I'm Jeremy. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the hole. Welcome to the belief hole. Today we have a great episode. We have an adventurous episode. Last one of season five. That's right. <laughs> We've been around for five seasons. That's right. Since 2018. Congratulations to us. And to you for being with us. It's a joint adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of adventure, we are ending on a high note. We have a good one today. Yeah. A little bit of a pun because a lot of this will take place in the tippy top of the world. Yes, the mountains. The mountains. Yes, they are tall. Yes, they are. And they are above us. Uh, Everest is a, is a common place. We are talking about something unexplained, something that lives in the world beyond, between this world and the next, the greatest mystery, what is beyond this life. And I think even more specifically interesting, the third man factor that we're talking about today, it not only touches on the idea of like life after death, near death experiences, what is this life? What does it mean? What, what is beyond this life? But Specifically in that state of life and death struggles, what is this experience that some people are having where it seems to unlock a mechanism either in their own consciousness to create what's called a second self, a projection that guides you and motivates you or gives you help to survive that extra push of willpower that you physically can see and communicate with at times? Or is it a connection to the divine that is only unlocked in those certain scenarios? where maybe a guardian angel is alerted at that moment that you need that. And for some reason, some people have the ability or the blessing, I guess you could say, to tap into that because they have a purpose that they need to remain. And they survive these extreme conditions and, and scenarios where they seemingly talk to another, an entity that it's often referred to as a familiar stranger. A companion is a word that's used a lot. Like a guardian angel almost. Exactly. And that's the question. What is it? What is this thing that people are, are experiencing? It sounds like, I mean, you know, I always go back to the stuff that I'm interested in, but it's from most of the accounts that I hear of these near-death experiences, it talks about how everyone has these beings that are assigned yeah. through their whole life. And so that kind of play, and some people are more receptive than others. So I imagine the people that are able to use this help somehow are able to be open to it. Mm -hmm. But I guess... So it seems like these are extreme conditions, what we're going into today. Yeah, so... In, in extreme places. Right, so specifically, this was kind of defined. We're going to be going off of this book, this fantastic book I definitely recommend you guys get. There will be a link in the show notes. It's called The Third Man Factor by John Geiger. And he specifically is pointing out this phenomena that, as I said, in these life and death struggles, they encounter these incorporeal beings, sometimes very physical, who provide, quote, companionship 
That's like the key thing in a lot of these scenarios is this encouragement and feeling of like, you're taken care of. It's going to be okay. Something outside of yourself, but this encouragement, guidance, even advice or, hey, here's your guiding rope to get you out of this cavern that you couldn't find while you're diving. Things like that, that somehow seem to point from some divine place, some other intelligence that you don't have at the time to help you escape. And yeah, often extreme and unusual environments, polar regions or alone at sea, circumnavigating the earth, whether in a plane or on a schooner or whatever you're doing, you're alone for long periods of time. Charles Lindbergh, we talked about that in previous episodes. People experience things, whether to keep them awake, alive, to make the right choice, to, to guide the ship straight, whatever it is, times of desperation specifically, either extreme physical condition, it can be extreme monotony. You're by yourself alone flying a plane for 24 hours straight. You go kind of, people would say crazy, hallucinate, but you are in certain situations where it could be doom or you survive with assistance. Yeah, it's fascinating because within this book that Jeremy's about to introduce, what's brought up are a lot of different theories, especially towards the end of the book on what this phenomena could be caused by. And of course, we have the things we're all interested in here in the whole, more supernatural angles on this phenomena. But it's also interesting to hear the developing scientific possible explanations for this that might be paranormal now, but more understood in the future. For example, a lot of the hikers that experience this, they don't feel that it's something from without, but it's something from within, maybe a, like a mechanism of the brain, which the author calls the angel switch. And we'll get into that, but it has to relate to an experiment that we've talked about briefly on the show during a shadow person episode where a woman with epilepsy had their brain stimulated in a certain area and it created the sensation of an other behind her or to the side. Um, so that's also really fascinating. Yeah. So, but that's going to be the things to consider as we go through this. Like some people feel that it is something from without something supernatural. Yeah. And some people believe that it is an internal brain mechanism that we just not don't understand yet, but it's like an evolutionary survival tool. Well, there was a great quote in the book and I don't have it in front of me, but to paraphrase, if I can remember, it was something like when this phenomenon first started happening or first really being identified back with um, Shackleton, mm -hmm. the great polar and Antarctic explorer, when he led an expedition called the Trans-Antarctic Expedition, whose goal was to be the first expedition to attempt the first ever land crossing of the Antarctic continent. Yeah, stuff of heroes. Yes. This was back in 1914. And of course, in that effort, his ship, the Endurance, was stuck in ice and eventually crushed by it. But yes, through all the hardships, he encountered something miraculous, an outside presence. And of course, it being a time when the world was much more, I don't know, how, you, how would you say it, Chris, uh, religious. Yeah, and uh, just more open to the idea of a spiritual reality before materialism got its complete stranglehold around the global culture. Yeah, or at least around the West. So in that time, they looked at this phenomena, this uh, other, this presence that would appear in these life-threatening situations, specifically first noted with Shackleton in the Antarctic as a kind of religious experience. At least he identified it as something supernatural, supernatural, if not divine, uh, this presence of the other, this companion that helped them along. So as, as this phenomena has been identified and kind of progresses through the um, stories of uh, extreme adventurers, right? Mountaineers, that kind of thing who experience, especially in, on the mountaintops in those places, the explanations have gone from a religious or spiritual nature. It's coming from the outside. It's coming from the divine. It's divine inter intervention to it's coming from the mind. And then finally, more recently, it's being suggested and maybe believed by more that it's coming from simply the brain. Right. Now, more reduction as you go exactly on. Exactly. Away from the miraculous and towards the material, like we talk about a lot of the show. Right. Well, it's like everything in culture. And I personally... While it could be a mechanism in the brain, for sure, there could be some state that the brain gets in and then it projects this, but there are still unexplained aspects of the phenomena, how ways that some people survive that seemed only possible because of the aiding by these entities, these others, these companions, whether it's information or guidance. Yeah, that's a good point. Or physically holding fast to a steering wheel while the person is laying on the floor, he's watching an ancient ship captain right. hold his ship's wheel still for 48 hours. Uh, yeah. Through waves. Remaining on course. Remaining on course. And the story I'm referencing will be in the expansion because there's so many great stories we're going to be doing with this. At one point, the person who is sick on the floor with food poisoning is asleep. He's the captain. He's the only one on board. And he's awoken by this companion, this old sea captain holding the wheel 
of the ship wakes him up to get him up to help because they're going to wreck. Now, hallucination or not, whatever you think, the timing is, yeah. Something woke him up from that sleep and saved him from the wreck. So anyways, we're going to get some great stories with this. And you guys let us know what you think about this. But it's a fascinating read. And I really, really recommend it. I think it's going to make you want to explore. And maybe just be a little more careful than uh, <laughs> some of the people that are sadly frozen on Everest. I always have a buddy. Or a third man. Uh, the book, The Third Man Factor, Surviving the Impossible by John Geiger. Terrific book. Again, link in the show notes. We're going to be getting a lot of the stories from there. But even beyond that, for those of you who may have heard this topic discussed before, the book was written, I think, in 2008 or 2009. But since then, he's built a website where you can submit your own accounts of this third person factor phenomena. So we're going to have kind of a fresh update with some news stories directly from his website, as well as some fantastic, synchronistically timed submitted speak pipes. <laughs> so strange, Listener man. stories from you guys out there that sent in that just happened to fit so perfectly. Literally last night, night before recording. Yeah, as we're trying to gather the, the final research and read through the book, we get this great speak pipe coming up from... Jamie. Jamie. Yeah, it's just right in line with what we were reading last night. It's just so bizarre. It's nice when it works out with the topic yeah. like that. But uh, one of the most famous accounts, the, one of the first identified accounts from Shackleton, as I said, the great polar explorer, his account is what the phenomena is named after, identified by Ernest Shackleton. But if you want to hear more about Shackleton's, like the full account and the story, and more into this, we actually were tipped off about this book by the guys from Expanded Perspectives. Kyle and Cam. They covered different aspects of this. I would recommend checking out that episode after this one. Our buddies. Our buddies. Good guys. <laughs> Shout out Kyle and Cam. But Shackleton, who this phenomenon is kind of named after, this great polar explorer, this was a time where you didn't talk about this stuff. Um, he would give lectures and do, you know, speeches about his travels, his uh, adventures. But interestingly, his, uh, his book that he wrote, South, which is a kind of autobiographical about this experience, even though it kind of came out that he had this experience with this other, this helpful companion, it didn't appear in the first publication of his book. And a lot of people said, well, that's because it's fictionalized. They probably used it for sensationalism uh, at the time to draw attention or whatever. But interestingly, there was a separate sheet of paper. It was labeled note, and it was in another transcript of Shackleton's original manuscript. Mysterious. Mysterious indeed. And apparently he did not include that passage in the original manuscript. And he said, quote, one couldn't write this sort of thing about the mystery of that fourth or the mysterious companion, if you will, the uh, divine intervention. Couldn't write this sort of thing about the mystery of the fourth in our journey, but it was the heart of it. Hmm. It was the heart of it all the same. Hmm. The author goes on, he may have regretted that he allowed so deeply personal a feeling to be made public. Quote, on occasions he would speak of it lightly or with embarrassment. He did nevertheless subsequently allude to it during some of his public lectures, and always with tremendous affect. One person who attended a banquet in Shackleton's honor recalled, quote, You could hear a pin drop when Sir Ernest spoke of his consciousness of a divine companion in his journeyings. That's cool. In fact, here's another quote I love, and this comes from the Daily Telegraph on this point about his conviction and the reality of the experience and, and his inability to talk about it. I think this was recorded in an interview in the early 1920s, I believe, with the Daily Telegraph. In your book, you speak of a fourth presence. He nodded his head. Do you care to speak about that? At once he was restless and ill at ease. No, he said. None of us cares to speak about that. There are some things which never can be spoken of. Almost to hint about them comes perilously near to sacrilege. This experience was eminently one of those things. In other words, it felt to him divine, mm -hmm. something you just don't, you maybe don't talk about, whether you're embarrassed or because it meant something so great. It was yeah. sacred. Anyways, fantastic stories coming up about this phenomenon. Yeah, let's start with the first account we have here. And this is a, a great way to start because it is the experience that our author Geiger had that led him down a course that would become this exploration into this strange third man factor. And this comes from his book, Third Man Factor. This is when he was a kid, right? Yeah, this is, um, this is when he was a kid. And his dad would be out um, working for geological surveys. And uh, this guy reminds me a lot of like um, Dr. Venture from Venture Brothers. Oh, yeah. Just because he's like this kind of, I mean, obviously guys do a better character than that is in integrity and stuff. But I just picture him wearing like a speed suit. He's like out adventuring. And his name even is sounds like a, some sort of 60s scientific superhero kind of character. Yeah. His name is K.W. Geiger. <laughs> just sounds yeah. like 
Anyway, um, I agree. But this is, uh, yeah, this, is, this is how it all began. When I was seven, I experienced something I have always wanted to experience again. I was on a field trip with my father, K.W. Geiger, a geologist who was working for the Research Council of Alberta. It was a sweltering day, and we were walking along a fringe of unbroken grassland near the top bank of the Old Man River. We climbed up a steep, dry embankment. There was a faint perfume of prairie rose bushes in the still air. I was following my father when I was stopped dead in my tracks by a rattlesnake, coiled and ready to strike. The noise was not calming, like a baby's rattle, but had a buzz of urgency about it. The snake was under a protruding rock that might have been a den. Most alarmingly, it was between my father and me. My father had passed by it and was standing above me on the embankment. I am unsure today exactly what happened next and how much of my memory is real and how much is a child's overactive imagination, but I do remember it all very clearly. There was a moment of sheer terror. Then, suddenly, there was a psychological shift of perspective. I felt detached from my immediate situation and surveyed the scene from another impossible angle. I was two people in two places at one time. I saw my father, and I saw a child, a child who could only have been me. If not me, then who? Yet I was seeing it all unfold from a distance, as an observer. Time seemed to slow, and yet it was all over in an instant. My father grabbed the boy with one arm, and with what seemed like superhuman strength, pitched him over his shoulder and out of danger. It was an unforgettable experience. One that could not possibly have happened as I remember it, or could it. All I know is that in my memory of the incident, when I count, there are not two, but three people there. Fascinating. Crazy. John, I don't know if this jogs your memory like it did mine, but it reminded me of a listener story we did. Uh, or it was, I'm sorry, it wasn't a listener story. It was a near-death experience where... The um, car accident? The car accident. And while they saw the car coming, that imminent danger left their body and went to the bird's eye view vantage point. Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yep. Just like this. I mean, it's that same sort of whatever mechanism. It's pretty common. Rattlesnake, boom, yeah. up out of the body before the death, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. It's almost like a buffer. Yeah. yeah. A pain and trauma buffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So t- this ties right into this third man factor. I mean, this is one of the ways that this is described. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Well, you're talking about like soul contracts and stuff like that. And I think you said something the other day about it's almost as if you made the contract and you're like, well, this wasn't in there. <laughs> like, <laughs> I remember this out byline <laughs> before the, uh, before the incident. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. So that's where this all began for him. And it w- it's not exactly the same kind of phenomena, right? Because right. I guess in this sense, he kind of becomes the third man to a degree, but that's, it's his consciousness, like an OBE, mm-hmm. essentially. But that leads him in this direction of what is this mechanism? Yeah, I was going to say, so years later, he's, uh, while reading Shackleton's narrative called South, the story of Shackleton's last expedition, Geiger discovers a passage that describes an unseen presence, just like he had sort of experienced, that appeared when Shackleton's ship Endurance had been crushed by the ice. And this, as Geiger says, is the most famous of all these encounters. You mentioned this earlier, Jer. And it was Shackleton's experience, though, that gave the phenomena its name, the third man. But anyway, so at this point in his life, he begins this hunt for these accounts, these varied reports that he finds spread out over all kinds of disciplines and books. And he finds cases that are much more extreme than his own. And he uses these works to kind of compile them together, because as you had told me, Jer, he was surprised that no one had gathered these accounts from different places and put them in one collection. It's a fantastic idea. So a lot of the stories in the book focus on obviously extreme conditions. It can happen even not in crazy places or locations with intense situational context, even in your personal life in moments of extreme stress or desperation, people have these encounters. Mm -hmm. So even though we're talking about, I think it happens most, most often, definitely most um, remarkably just because of the atmosphere in these extreme places. And one such place famous for this is Mount Everest. A mountain that still has over 200 frozen bodies littering it wow. of climbers because they can't remove them. Mm-hmm. So people climb past. Um, and there's a little bit we're going to talk about that in the expansion 
Because even though it's macabre, I think it is fascinating, harrowing kind of storyline of some of these situations that these climbers go through. And even it's just so bizarre to me that people want the mountain so bad that yeah. not only do they push themselves to this level, but you know they'll stop in the cave of uh, Green Boots, I think is his name, who's a fellow who passed away. It looks like by his clothes, maybe the 90s or 80s. They'll shelter there before they keep going on next to a, oh, he's still a guy there. who's been dead for, you know. Oh, crazy. And I don't understand why we, we, at some point we could get drones. Like I know it's dangerous to bring them back down, but you're starting to see like medical people use drones to like fly themselves it's up. It's almost and, like a badge of honor. Yeah, well, I think you to know a degree. What I mean, like, I mean, tragic, be, but, kind of weird. No, I mean, just the fact that you're like leaving them there. It's like, oh, like a, I mean, the family memorial? might feel differently, yeah. but. Yeah, it's like a memorial. Yeah. You know, it, it's kind of hard to explain. Oh, it's like in Goonies when they find uh, the guy in the old captain, whatever. He's like a skeleton now and they oh, find him down there. There's a, like One-Eyed Willie. One-Eyed Willie. They find him and they like give him his bag of coins back. I like, can't take it from One-Eyed <laughs> Willie, which is also a real story. It's factual. Yes, it's true. <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, John, it's funny you bring that up. The idea of leaving them up as like a kind of a memorial monument. I mean, it's, it's obviously tragic and macabre, but there is kind of a a majesty to it. Yeah, I can see it. Like if they get discovered right away and they know who well, they are, then, be, then yeah. obviously then they should try to get them down. But Absolutely. If, it's like, if you don't know who it is and maybe it's like 30 years or like a hundred years later, you know. And obviously it really should come down to what the family wants and what the climber wanted. Oh, for sure. So it is, it is odd that they're still there. But you bring up that point and I was going to save this for the expansion, but I may as well mention that there was a, a Sherpa named Dorja Sherpa, Tigers of the Snow. I think is what they're often referred to as these amazing Sherpas. But this guy was apparently climbing Everest in 2004 and he had passed a mound of rocks and claimed that he had seen spirits in the form of black shadows. Mm. He said, quote, I saw some spirits in the form of black shadows coming towards me, stretching their hands and begging for something to eat. I think those were the spirits of the many mountaineers killed during and after their ascent of Mount Everest. A sad thought. Yeah. That suck to die in an environment like that and you do get stuck for some it's reason. It's crazy. I mean, it's like a still life of tragedy, essentially. Um, this article goes on to say, the bodies of many of those who died are still in the mountain and one climber who died from an accidental fall is still hanging from a rope. Many Sherpas Jeez. believe the ghosts of Everest will not be appeased or leave the mountain until the bodies of the deceased are given a proper burial. Makes sense. With so many corpses stuck in the, quote, death zone, which is above 8,000 meters, and more joining them each year, it's unlikely that the mountain will be a ghost-free zone anytime soon. And actually, we're going to have a story coming up because we're talking about this kind of divine intervention, this uh, or ethereal entity companion that people are seeing. But ghosts, for sure. These mountains are haunted, I would say. And one famous story that is often attributed to mountain sickness, a hallucination, also sounds like a very creepy ghost lady. So that story is coming up as well. Before we climb to the peaks of Mount Everest and get into some more of these stories, one of the reasons we were inspired to do this episode now was because of a couple great speak pipes we got recently. So I want to bring one in now. Uh, and it also comes from a fellow who is a bit of an adventurer himself. I think he's a rock climbing instructor. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Um, Michael. Michael. And this was a fantastic story. And it, I think he's not sure what this was either, but it fits right into this idea of there being this mm -hmm. guiding hand, this helper, this force. So let's, uh, let's roll tape. Here we go. What's up, gentlemen? Michael here from Georgia. Hey, I was listening to a podcast that y'all recently did with the boys at Expanded Perspectives. And I, there was a story that was told early on in the podcast about the skateboarder who was bombing that hill and um, saw the homeless guy and it caused him to stop and he thinks it kept him from getting hit by a car. Um, that reminded me of two instances that happened when I was 16. They happened relatively close together. It's never happened again since. I just brushed it off to one-off stuff and I don't really think about it. But when I was 16, I just got my license. I was young and dumb. And my dad had a Mustang at the time that he, for some reason, would let me drive. Uh, and I remember going to a buddy's house. I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna haul ass on this one. I'm going to get there. And I remember I had to be going like 100 miles an hour, like a little two-lane highway, straight run. And something, I, I heard my name yell, Michael! Just really loud like that. It sounded like someone was in the back seat, like yelling at me. That's what it felt like. And obviously no one's in there. I slowed down, scared me, and um, kept driving. Nothing happened. Like a grandma didn't pull out 
of her driveway 10 feet away where I thought, oh, I would have hit her if I would have kept going. Like, nothing like that happened. I just kept driving and let it go. At the time, I was working at, like, a family fun center, and they just, they had, like, a rock wall. It had, like, four faces on it. It was probably, like, 50 feet tall or whatever. And my job that day was I was working the rock wall. So you had, when you started your shift, you had to climb the, all the faces of the wall and hit the buzzer at the top to make sure that they was working. So I put my harness on, climb three of the faces of the wall, all good, get to the last one, which is like the hardest one. And I start climbing it. I'm like, man, I'm climbing this easier than ever. I was like, I'm actually getting better at this, which is cool. I get to the top, hit the buzzer, about to let go. Same thing happens. Michael! Just really loud to the point. I looked around. I was like, oh, the manager's here. I'm getting in trouble. I did something wrong. Look around. No one's there. But as I'm looking around, I noticed that the cable that hooks to my harness is running all the way to the floor. And I had forgotten to hook up as I climbed that wall. And I was about to let go and take a 50-foot fall. I probably wouldn't be, you know, making this recording right now. Climb back down, scared shitless. Obviously go on with my day. And that's the, that's never happened to me again. Um, I'm not a religious person. Like, that's not it. So I thought that was super strange. And I, I, I tell everybody the story. I, I love telling the story. And um, uh, feel free to share it. Appreciate what you guys are doing. Love the show. And uh, yeah, listen to you soon. Oh, man, that's a, such a good story. Yeah, dude. And it's so poignant. Mm-hmm. I mean, to realize right then, too, that you're about <laughs> to jump off. They're yeah, in my legs. That would really shake me up. That's a perfect example of what this episode. Yeah, it's a perfect crossover. Yeah. And the two questions of like, is it a supernatural helper or is it subconscious? Yeah, maybe? something that you noticed and but you didn't know head, you noticed it. It'd be like it's, deep in the subconscious right. somewhere. Some part of you that, that knew that that wasn't hooked in. Right. Almost yeah. like, trying to get your attention. Yeah. Or maybe a dead loved one, you know? Actually, when I was trying to find rock wall ambience, uh-huh. For the story, which was impossible to find. <laughs> uh, I was looking at like YouTube shorts and stuff. And I saw a guy fall from, uh, he was probably like 50 or 60 feet up at least in a gym. Yeah. All the way down. Bounced off the floor. Uh, what kind Apparently he survived, but say, it was like insane to see him just that fall far? all the way down. I didn't know they went that high. Well, he was yeah, on the cable, yeah. but like it didn't work for some reason. Wow. And people were just standing right there when it happened and no one knew what to do. Right. No one knew knew how to react when it happened. I think it was somewhere in Asia. But you'd be so careful after that for so long. Yeah. I can see myself being in that moment where you're just so, it'd be like shooting a gun or something, you know, and just somehow spinning around looking and realizing the safety was off and you were just about ready to dry fire or something. Yeah. Something stupid where. Like what happened to dad in Vietnam. Remember that? Uh, this kid kept pointing his gun at him and like at the barracks or whatever, just as a joke. And he's just like, it's not loaded. It's not loaded, perfect. What are you so scared of? And then and he shoots, the shoots next to his head and blows a hole in the floor. Was it next to his head? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like ear to muzzle, but it was like he pointed yeah, it away right, from him right. and shot. Yeah, like, I mean, it can just end that quickly. Yeah. And just, that always reminds you of like being near a ledge and like thinking of a bee coming by and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, ah. that's pretty, yeah. Because it's just like, sounds like I can relate. It's such a stupid thing, <laughs> but it could happen. I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure it has. You're on your way down. You're like, I cannot believe. I just tried to get away from a little bumblebee and I jumped off this cliff. That would be me. Yeah, I know. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I wish I had footage of you, John, responding to any insects. The flying ones that get him. It's the flying it's stinging ones. The flying stinging. <laughs> you know why it is? It's because I got stung when I was a child. Traumatized. Yeah. We all have gotten stung when we were children. Well, that's yeah, true. but mine was like especially traumatic because <laughs> I was trying to save him. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. We were at like church camp and... I was at the pool with my father mm-hmm. and I was trying to save this wasp. He's like, don't do it. You're going to get stung. And I was like, but he's drowning. And I pulled him off and he stung me. There you go. And I was, it really hurt. I remember. And ever since then, I'm just like, when they come around, I'm just, <laughs> I turn into a little girl. <laughs> it's so unlike you the way you move when an insect comes around. It's, the it's funniest so thing. like, <laughs> it's like this, that viral video of that news reporter when that lizard jumps on him. Yeah. <laughs> That's. <laughs> <laughs> you make that sound that is just not human. Uh, for you two listeners, we're going to put that in the video. Unless I'm on a date, then I act tough. Then you'll just be like, I'll get your wasp. But honey. inside, I'm screaming like a little girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but so by the cliff, you would hold it in. You wouldn't jump. Yeah, no, I, I can hold you it can manage. in. manage. Yeah. Just around friends and family, were you? Yeah, I mean, if I was in any dangerous situation, I'm on like overdrive as far as what yeah. to do and not to do. Reaction. Because I'm an alpha. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. 
Um, anyway, thank you so much for that story, Michael. Michael. Great story, Michael. Um, Reminds me of that movie. About the angel? Yep. With John Travolta? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Great story. Thanks for sending that in. Fits nicely. <laughs> Absolutely. So getting back to Everest. One of the most important early mountaineers, a part of this kind of tribe of guys that were doing this at the time, was a man by the name of Frank Smythe. This story takes place when he's up on a mountain with another fella, Eric Shipton, in 1933. This is a time when mountaineering, climbing like this, was in its infancy, and not all of Everest had been conquered. These are all trailblazers out there, right? Right. Pioneers, really. Now, the situation they're in while trying to complete their climb on Everest in 1933 If you can imagine Frank Smythe and Eric Shipton, as the author says, emerge from their canvas tent at 8,351 meters on Mount Everest. A blinding blizzard had forced them to spend two nights at Camp 6 in the so-called high altitude death zone. This is the altitude where it's above 8,000 meters and it's dangerous for advanced climbers, even those that are acclimatized to the climate, just because of the altitude. And since this time, since the early days of climbing, climbers have learned to limit their exposure by camping at lower altitudes before making their final bid for the summit. So the second night, the weather improves, and they decide to make their attempt to summit the mountain. Now, at this point, they're extremely feeble. They said anyone that saw them would say that they should really be hospitalized at this point. But of course, that mentality to conquer the mountain. So they keep going. Their physical conditions have deteriorated rapidly, but they press on. They climb slowly and with frequent stops, diagonally up towards the great couloir on a gradual incline that reminded Shipton of a roof. Even so, he found himself, quote, weak as a kitten. And when they reached a formation on Everest called the First Step at 8,500 meters, Smythe heard an exclamation behind him. Turning, he saw Shipton leaning heavily on his ice axe. A moment later, Shipton slumped down and announced he was unable to go on. I'm done. I can't go any further. The 4th British Everest Expedition, which had begun as a large, meticulous planned military-style assault, had come down to just one man. Frank Smythe was an unlikely candidate for the job. He had been invalided out of the Royal Air Force in 1927, suffered a heart murmur, and was not obviously fit. Yet he was a skilled and resolute climber, and now he was on his own. Sometime after parting company with Shipton, Smythe encountered a fresh accumulation of deep powdered snow. This new layer failed to support his weight, and with each step, he sank deeply, greatly increasing the difficulty of the climb. He persisted, reaching the great couloir. The summit of Mount Everest was only 300 meters higher, yet it might have been a thousand kilometers away. Smythe described being, quote, overcome by a feeling of hopelessness and weariness. His limbs were trembling from the exertion. He gasped for air. His heart was pounding against his ribcage. In such a condition, the technical challenge of the climb began to appear insurmountable. Smythe felt like, quote, a prisoner struggling vainly to escape from a vast hollow enclosed by dungeon-like walls. Wherever I looked, hostile rocks frowned down on my impotent strugglings. At one point, he slipped, losing his footing so quickly that, quote, my sluggish brain had no time to register a thrill of fear. Uh. Smythe was saved only by his ice axe, which was jammed in a crack and held his weight. Not until later did he fully comprehend the extreme danger of that moment. He was climbing now, quote, in a curiously detached, impersonal frame of mind. It was almost as though one part of me stood aside and watched the other struggle on. Lack of oxygen and fatigue are responsible for this dulling of the mental faculties, but principally, lack of oxygen. He likened his condition to that of a drunken automobile driver Smythe tried to continue, shoveling away flowery snow with his gloves in order to gain each foothold. It was a laborious task, and it proved to be his undoing. Finally, Smythe determined, quote, it was the limit. He stood for some time alone at the very boundaries of life and death, at an elevation as high as any man had ever reached. As he put it later, quote, 
the last 1,000 feet of Everest are not for mere flesh and blood. Smythe then climbed down to a broad ledge and halted for a rest. When I reached the ledge, I felt I ought to eat something in order to keep up my strength. All I had brought with me was a slab of Kendall mint cake. This I took out of my pocket and carefully dividing it into two halves, turned around with one half in my hand to offer to my companion. After leaving Shipton and throughout his subsequent struggles, Smythe had a, quote, strange feeling that I was accompanied by another. He was embarrassed by the idea and said it was only with great diffidence that he placed an account of the phenomenon on the official record, and then only at the request of Hugh Rutledge, the expedition leader. All the time that I was climbing alone, I had a strong feeling that I was accompanied by a second person. This feeling was so strong that it completely eliminated all loneliness I might otherwise have felt. It seemed that I was tied to my companion by a rope, and that if I slipped, he would hold me. I remember constantly glancing back over my shoulder. He emphasized the strength and sense of safety he gained from this unseen companion. Quote, In its company, I could not feel lonely, neither could I come to any harm. It was always there to sustain me on my solitary climb up the snow-covered slabs. At the moment he held out the piece of mint cake, Smythe said the presence was, quote, so near and so strong that it was almost a shock to find no one to whom to give it. He felt the intentions of his companion were clear. It seemed to me that this presence was a strong, helpful, and friendly one, and it was not until Camp 6 was sighted that the link connecting me, as it seemed at the time to the beyond, was snapped, and although Shipton and the camp were but a few yards away, I suddenly felt alone. That's interesting. So I find that fascinating that he's alone trying to survive this mountain, his extreme conditions, and he senses this companion suddenly and believes firmly that this presence is there so much that he offers him cake. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, getting back to the camp, finally surviving with the help and guidance and motivation of his companion, encouraging him, this ethereal friend stranger, as he approaches his camp and his co-mountain climbers, you have this entity leaves, he feels that go, and he feels suddenly alone. And I find it interesting that as he's coming back to his friends, he feels more alone. Right. Because this warm, and like a lot of people talk about this feeling of whatever this is, it's this warm, loving, almost deeper connection that you would have with maybe someone you're actually going to go bond with on the mountain, the lifetime friend, family member. There's something deep here, and in some reports you hear it as like a fatherly, angelic, Jesus-like in some cases people reported just basically, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be okay. Yeah. Anyways, I thought that was a great example. It's one of the early ones. And this guy, he'll go on to have more experiences and we're going to get to some really bizarre ones. But I was really interested in the um, specific detail of the cake. It was making me kind of hungry. Yeah. You need nourishment when you're on those mountains. And I was like, man, I wish I had some HelloFresh. Yes! Ah, yes. This episode is brought to you by our good friends at HelloFresh. Hello, Fred. Hello, Fred. Hello, Fred. Freaking <laughs> yum, by the way, and ridiculously convenient. Yeah. Delivered right to your door. Simple 50 minute recipes. Yeah. The recipes are always changing, and the stuff that we had was super interesting. Yeah. That's one of the best parts about it. They're always changing. You're going to find really unique stuff that's super simple to prepare. Yeah. Like the curry was complex. The curry like, chicken was delicious. Savory. Too. Yeah. Super convenient, as we said, getting right to your door. You don't have to leave the house. Yeah. Whether you want to save money or eat better or stress less, I mean, this is the way to go. I mean, it feels like a, you're getting a gift in the mail. It's yeah. a big, beautiful box packaged perfectly. I love how seriously fresh it was. Like, yeah. Fresh is in the name for a reason, apparently. Everything is pre-portioned. You don't have to worry about buying a bunch of different ingredients and then throwing stuff away right. or not using stuff. But the freshness factor. Freshness. I mean, you go to the grocery store and I don't know how many times there's spinach that's a little crinkly or darkening. Like this was, yeah. I like the greens in there were just off the plant. Hello, fresh. Hello, fresh indeed. Hello. It's fresh. So go to hellofresh.com slash belief hole free. That's all lowercase belief hole free and use code belief hole free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at hellofresh.com slash belief hole free with the code belief hole free, all lowercase. Get it. And thank you, HelloFresh, for making the show 
extra special. You're our third man today. <laughs> and after all, it is America's number, number one, one meal kit. kit. All right. <laughs> yes. Well, let's get back on the mountain now that we're satiated. Anyway, back onto the mountain and the strangeness that lies above. So we left off from the mountain and Frank Smythe was pretty cold up there. Understandable. He had his companion, but it would not be the only unexplained phenomena that he would come across on the snowy, mysterious caps of Everest. I'll have to double check this. I think it's the same climb attempt that he experiences this very unusual... Um, favorite in the hole. Yeah, fairly inexplicable set of beings, I guess you'd call them, up in the air above Everest. Sky creatures. I call this the sky wheels cometh. I was still some 200 feet above C6 and a considerable distance horizontally from it when, chancing to glance in the direction of the North Ridge, I saw two curious looking objects floating in the sky. They strongly resembled kite balloons in shape, but one possessed what appeared to be squat, underdeveloped wings and the other a protuberance suggestive of a beak. They hovered motionless, but seemed slowly to pulsate, a pulsation much slower than my own heartbeats, which is of interest, supposing that it was an optical illusion. The two objects were very dark in color and were silhouetted sharply against the sky, or possibly a background of cloud. So interested was I that I stopped to observe them. My brain appeared to be working normally and I deliberately put myself through a series of tests. First of all, I glanced away. The objects did not follow my vision, but they were still there when I looked back. Then I looked away again, and this time identified by name a number of peaks, valleys, and glaciers by way of a mental test. But when I looked back again, the objects confronted me. At this, I gave them up as a bad job. But just as I was starting to move, Again, a mist suddenly drifted across. Gradually, they disappeared behind it, and when a minute or two later it had drifted clear, exposing the whole of the North Ridge once more, they had vanished, as mysteriously as they came. Weirdies. Now, that's probably one of the strangest stories I've heard. You know what it reminded me of listening back to that? Stanley Gaster. Underdeveloped wings and a beak. <laughs> yeah, the beak is super weird. Didn't remind me of like the jellyfish sky creature that we're used to. Well, this is how, what he describes them as, uh, similar to a kite balloon. If you guys don't know what that is, um, check the show notes or the video if you're watching on YouTube. Oh, sky whale. These look like freaking sky whales. I mean, they're yeah. giant, bulbous kind of, uh, think of it kind of as like a dirigible or a blimp, blimp-ish kind of thing, but then weighted down or at one end has a... I guess a kite that it's it allows it to be guided easier. This is a World War One. I, I was gonna say, what are those for? World War One um, surveillance, information or gathering kind of balloon. Yeah, but they look really weird, um, somewhat phallic, uh, but definitely like sky whales. <laughs> definitely like, <laughs> a little phallic. <laughs> definitely like a floating, uh, pulsating. But obviously, creatures. like a kite and not a balloon. You mean or a balloon? Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a kite balloon. You wouldn't mistake that for a living creature. Right. So what he was seeing, you know, whether it was hallucination brought on by oh, that's true. lack of oxygen that's true. or whatever, and it was just miss seeing something in the sky, or I mean, we hear accounts of sky creatures. Although so. I think his point was interesting there where he said, you know, the f one specific point to the hallucination factor was that his, uh, <laughs> that one definitely, that one kind of looks like a creature, right? That looks like a sperm whale. Just like getting ready to breach. There's a little man in the... Like a sky snail. Yeah. Little man in the basket. Little man in the basket. British kite balloon. Well, yeah, he said that those, the creatures, they were, they were pulsing, but they weren't pulsing at the same time of his heartbeat. You know what I mean? So he was saying like, it wasn't my heartbeat, which made me think that these things were pulsing. It was so, when speaking about hallucinations... Oh, that's what you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. That's how I understood that anyway. I was thinking they're pulsing, maybe it was suggesting that since they're much larger entities that their heart rate was much slower. Because like, <laughs> nothing like, in the sky, just like, boom, boom, I think you're boom, boom, connecting boom. too many notes. Truth there. Anyway, really just bizarre, fascinating story. There's a great quote in the book. I don't have it in front of me, but it was something like, uh, men in their effort to climb great mountains frequently see curious things. Or something to that effect. Yeah. 
very common. And of course, the argument is mountain madness, uh, hallucination, lack of oxygen. And you're up pretty high too. So if they are real, then you're probably more likely to see them exactly. up there. Exactly. That is a point for the believer and all of you out there. It's like being on a plane for a long period of time. Is it? What does that mean? Well, I mean, you're just up high for a long period of time. Oh, so you're more likely to see something in the sky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The question is, interesting what are you seeing? Makes you think about just all the crazy stuff that we're seeing more and more in the sky mm-hmm. over the past couple of years. And when you're in remote areas like this, yeah, you know, or significant areas like this, you got to wonder how many things you might see like that, like strange things in the sky. Just had a friend film some interesting footage. That's right. Pretty incredible. Brian. Yeah. One of my childhood friends sent me a very strange video that he captured in Texas. Mm -hmm. It's like a weird rotating kinetic energy type ball. In the sky. Weird thing. Yeah. Very strange. Don't know what it is. No no lights on it. No lights. It it looks plasmic almost. Yeah. It has that kinetic kind of weird energy thing in the center where it's almost like hollow. It's like spinning. You can almost see it move independently on the inside. It reminds me of if you ever zoom into... um, stars with a telescope Mm -hmm. uh, or a camera rather like a digital camera it's like elusive yeah undulating kind of uh, translucent um looks like an organism like a cell or something i mean that's how the ufo that i saw looked as far as the lights right exactly oh that was definitely that was way higher and it was like three light it was a triangle shape but the the lights on the outside were undulating and almost they had a life force to it it looked like like an energy system maybe like a pulsating lava Mm -hmm. sort of thing Organic energy and source. And moved around the sky faster than the speed of light. Do you think it could have been a living thing? Or did that feel more technology to you? Or do you think based on it your felt mindset? Like a mix almost. Yeah. It felt organic. It was a Cylon ship. You know, I don't think it, I don't think it was a, personally, I don't think it was like a creature. Mm-hmm. I think it was a craft that was using some sort of more natural technology or something that we just don't understand. Something more elemental. Not like a combustion engine. Yeah. Do you think it's possible that there are some life forms out there in the universe that could be harnessed and ridden like horses in space that sure. they're like <laughs> they're like a, like a sky will rider well you see the uh star trek discovery that i think allegedly took the idea from someone else who'd written some fan oh, fiction yeah. or, or a game based on it but the trilobite no 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 tart tardigrade tardigrade trilobite, trilobite would be a different thing tardigrade where you integrate part of an organic uh life form into the ship yeah to either give it special abilities or mm-hmm. you know power it or and, but yeah, sure. slave labor. It's, so it's possible that what people are seeing up there that appears organic, but also may have some connection to more traditional ET experiences, quote unquote, that maybe there's a hybridization of symbiotic relationship between these two groups. They're space horses. I think so. Sky whales. Anyway, I just thought that was a great account. It's always good to include the sky whales. Yeah. So thank you, Frank Smythe, for that. So I mentioned this account earlier. We talk about these helpful beings, entities, angels, self-reflections, whatever you want to call them. But I did mention that there are some ghosts, if you will. Now this account, again, hallucination, you're always wondering, it's always a possibility in these situations. But this comes from Elizabeth Revel, a French mountaineer who's climbing Nanga Parbat in Pakistan, also known as Killer Mountain. Mm -hmm. Treacherous place. Reminds you of Dyatlov. Yeah. Now, you be the judge. Is this ghost or hallucination? This comes from Climbing Magazine. During her ascent of Naga Parbat in winter, Revel encountered severe conditions at an altitude of 6,800 meters. It was during her third open bivouac on the mountain that she, quote, hallucinated meeting an old, wrinkled lady. The hallucination offered her warm tea, but only if, quote, You give me your shoes. Revel did as requested and woke up the next morning with a frozen foot. Quote, Fuck. What happened? She thought to herself. So again, mountain sickness, hallucination, or the ghost of the mountain, the old lady. Uh, what is interesting about that is the shoe thing. Because mm-hmm. it just makes me think of all the missing 401 accounts with the shoes and why people take their shoes off when they get lost. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe they were Nikes. Maybe they're Nike. They were just <laughs> Jordans. <laughs> they're just very valuable. <laughs> there is something oh, I see the old lady really wanted like Jordan yeah. shoes. <laughs> Give me your Jordans. <laughs> there is something um about like for instance hypothermia, right? Where mm-hmm. 
people will take off their clothes because yep. they feel hot or I forget exactly how that works. Yeah. Remember? Uh, for some yeah, reason, they get they can, really hot. They feel super hot when they start to go, get, through, go actually right? into hypothermia. Yeah. So maybe that it was a bit of that. So she was hallucinating someone asking her for the shoe to explain her need to take it off. Yeah, I think they often find people strip naked when they're yeah when they freeze to death. Not often, but I mean it happens. Yeah, that was an explanation too for the um, Dyatlov Pass. Why the some of the hikers were without clothes. God, that'd be such a weird ending. Yeah, yeah. You're like I'm so hot. <laughs> that although that remember we did that the first season. Yeah. But it, really interesting, I, we saw um, Thinker Thunker did a YouTube breakdown of, uh, and I don't know, John, if we talked about this, but the first, or the last picture on the roll of film that they had. We mentioned that, yeah. Was a black figure in the distance. Hunting them, it looked like. Le- yeah. Leaning over in their direction, obviously walking towards them. But you can't make out the figure. It's assumed that it's one of the other... Hikers? One of their, one of their buddies, because it's, you know, it's a group alone hiking together that it's one of them all bundled up, maybe wearing a face mask so you can't make out the features. But then he compares a bunch of other images of the other hikers from the same trip. All the images show some form of facial feature. This one's just also, it's, all black. It's all black, and but the picture itself he shows is overexposed. So it should not be this all black thing. And then when you get the glare... Be, so if you basically, if you unexpose it, you darken the image, whatever, it becomes like jet black. Yeah. And then the trees look normal, and this thing is now a jet black giant, apparently. And much wider, because there's no glare Super on it. Super girthy. Oh, yeah, and the, with exposure, there's this halo effect that basically kind of makes the um, perimeter of your body disappear a little, which makes you look smaller in some places. So this thing looks kind of awkward and gangly. But when you look at that aura around the body from overexposure, and you replace that back in where it should be, you realize this thing is built like a giant gorilla, like a thick, tall, stocky... Mm-hmm thing so it goes back to that argument that being the last photo that was snapped on the camera was there something chasing them when i think we talked about on the, on the episode too about this if you guys don't know the dial of past hikers dying mysteriously um in russia one of the weird things was they cut their way out of the tent instead of using the door mm-hmm. and i think we talked about this idea too because there was the right trying to sneak out trying to maybe they the saw way. these things these would uh thinker thunker refer to as mountain giants outside out the front door of the tent. And so they quietly tried to escape out the back by c- cutting their way through. Hoping or they return. were just hallucinating. Well, of course. Yeah. And it was just a... I don't know why they thought... That. <laughs> I don't know. that. I mean, that seems a little delusional. To what? The, Cut your way I out? mean, a tent... I guess, a, how big is the tent? I mean, it was a big... It's a big group tent. Like 10 people. And to the, be they in were just standing out there and were they were not doing anything? Well, they, if they were out there, you know scuffling around well, the, the, talking to each other right. you know grunting yeah, or whatever the, the question is or the suspicion was that there might have been encounters previous encounters with these things that were violent yeah so get out if you can hope to return because you're going to die out there but you can't stay there for the moment yeah. anyway i know that it's not their idea I mean, it makes more sense than the current explanation that an avalanche came and then a magical wind came and then blew the avalanche out before people showed up like you know anyway check out that episode we did maybe we'll do a follow-up sometime it's archived now but for expansion yeah. members it's there anyways onwards onwards um, you guys want to get out of the mountains for a little bit? Sure. sure. I'm getting a little cold. I'm getting a little cold. I was thinking we could freshen this up with some new experiences of this phenomena. Again, I recommend the book. We barely got to scratch the surface on this book and the theories behind it all. We'll touch on that a little bit, but fantastic recording of these accounts, uh, beautifully written from John Geiger. Third person factor. Link will be in the show notes. And again, check out Expanded Perspectives, their episode as well. We still got to talk about the possible explanations. Yeah, yeah. But we have... A couple accounts from the website that have been added after the fact from John Geiger's site, collecting more of these stories, taking us different places around the world where this phenomenon is occurring. And we have the speak pipe that kind of put the icing on the cake for us to do this episode. Well, it came in while we were already studying for it, which was That's strange. true. It, that's why I said icing on the cake. The cake was being battered, and then she buttered it for us. Okay. Uh, fascinating speak pipe coming up. So without further ado, I love this story. This comes from... The Third Person Factor website, which we'll have linked in the show notes, guys, because the website's kind of long. It's like igloocities.thirdpersonfactor. So link in the show notes. This story comes from John Robbins from the forum, and I call it Surf's Up. At age 13, some 54 years ago, I was caught in extremely heavy surf that I should have known to not enter. But the challenge of the big surf lured me into the water, even though it was late in the day and there didn't seem to be anybody else on the beach. The pattern of wave breaks is usually the same. They came in sets of three, with the third wave being the largest. 
A jetty protecting the entrance to the adjacent harbor protruded out into the ocean about a quarter mile. The first incoming wave of this larger set of waves hitting the end of the jetty alerted me to their arrival. This would give me enough time to run down to the water, dive in, swim out through the breaking white water of the first two waves, and be in position to catch the third and largest wave. This was standard practice for body surfing at this beach for experienced swimmers, and I considered myself experienced, having body surfed for at least the past several years. When swimming out through surf, standard practice is to dive beneath the breaking white water rolling in towards the beach to avoid being battered by the force of the incoming surge. Well, in this case, I immediately realized as the wall of white water surging towards me from the first wave break of the set that this was the largest surf I had ever encountered. I dove down as deep as I could trying to get as flat as I could on the sandy seabed to avoid being thrown down against it by the force of the raging turbulence above me. Still, I was thrown about like a rag doll, smacking my head into the sand. The roiling water went on for much longer than I had ever experienced before. I was getting desperate for air. At last, I was able to come to the surface for air. I gasped but got very little. Instead, I inhaled a mouthful of water from the backwash wave created by the water rushing back off the beach from the wave that had just driven me under previously. This caused me to cough and sputter, thus reducing my ability to get a good breath of air. I was in water about chest high with an extremely strong riptide wanting to suck me further out to sea. I looked desperately at the shoreline, no more than 40 yards away, for anybody to help me but there was no one. But I couldn't look for very long because the second and larger wave had broken and its wall of white water, perhaps six to eight feet thick, was roaring towards me. I had no choice, short of breath or not, to dive or I would be terribly battered and broken by the force of the surf. Down I went, the thrashing even worse than the first wave. I could not get back to the surface. My lungs were screaming for air, but I continued to be roiled about, unable to do anything but wait for the turbulence to subside. At last, I was able to break the surface and gasp for air. But for the second time, I gulped water instead of air, resulting in more choking and gasping. At this moment, I think I realized I was about to die. I could see my house up on the bluff less than a half a mile away. I was having flashes of my life, which seemed like an instant rerun of my entire life. Suddenly to my left, there was a man with a flimsy little air mat, like one might use in a swimming pool, saying, You look like you could use some help. Take a hold of this. I did, and the next thing I remember is that I am gliding into the shore on the leading edge of white water of the third and largest wave. This memory defies all logic of what should have happened in such a situation. Even with an air mat to hold on to, being hit by a wall of white water of that size would still thrash someone about with great ferocity, and yet it seemed as if I just glided into the shore. Needless to say, I was exhausted by the experience and needed a few moments to recover my breath. I sat on the water's edge, arms on my knees, panting. Then I thought to thank my rescuer. I looked up and there was no one visible in either direction along the shoreline. Nor was there anyone further back on the beach. There was no air mat. I was alone. What transpired in this event? Did my angel switch turn on? This third man was not vague. I feel I could pick him out of a lineup. He didn't look at all familiar to me. He didn't look like he was an experienced beacher. His skin was white from little exposure to the sun. He seemed like a balding, middle-aged, somewhat paunchy working man that maybe worked in a warehouse or welding shop, a place that kept him out of the sun. 
but not an office worker for some reason. Never before the event or after have I had experience even close to what transpired that day. In terms of how the surf interacts with objects in it, I have no memory of being battered as we rode that little flimsy air mat into the shore, and yet I remember the events leading up to the actual encounter quite clearly. I can generally accept the idea that the experiences like this can generate an internal mechanism for survival that manifests as an external being, but how to explain that I got to shore? It is true that my sense of time may have become distorted and that my rescuer had time to leave the beach before I looked up to give thanks, but not likely. The distances I could see were quite far. I told several friends about it the next day and they just laughed at me. So I didn't bring it up with anybody after that for years after, but I never could forget it. It definitely conditioned me to be open-minded about the nature of things. My religious upbringing was Protestant, but I looked upon church as something to be endured, not something I looked forward to attending. And yet this experience had all the miraculous qualities of some of the Bible stories I had heard in Sunday school. The drowning episode didn't make me any more religious, but certainly left me with a very open mind to the reality that things are not always as rational as we might like to think they are. Pretty cool account. Nice. Yeah. And that's key too, I think, for this episode. Um, it's interesting to hear the stories where there is sort of some sort of like unknowable knowledge. Mm-hmm. Some part of you seems like couldn't know. And we've got another story coming up like that. Yeah. Or physical helper. Yeah. And in the expansion, we'll be getting into more of those accounts where there's, they're a little more harder to dismiss uh, when it comes to the supernatural elements. Right. So what's going on in the expansion? So the expansion, we're going to continue our way into these volatile environments and experiences. Here's some more interesting stories related to this third man phenomenon. Yeah. But also get into a little more of the haunted side of these strange places, specifically Antarctica, a land of mystery. Yeah. So we'll be doing that. We're going to have strange survival at sea accounts, which are pretty gripping. And we're going to get into more possible explanations, both skeptical and supernatural of this phenomenon. And one story that includes a cryptic and grim message scrawled on the walls of an arguably haunted Antarctic radio hut. Yes. And the inscription goes as follows. As Whistler's and Gibbon's cries screech in the ears, the ghost of Rivengen burst into tears. Why have you come to disturb me? After these many years, I will haunt and will taunt you and drive you away. Yeah, haunting, haunting stories. The adventure continues in the expansion. So if you're not a member, go to bluepool.com and click on the big red join the expansion button and you'll get double the episodes, wonderfully produced, just as long episode every time we drop. We got the whole first archive season in there as well. That's true. And uh, probably over a hundred expansion episodes. You guys might get lonely over our break because we are taking a break over January. So if you're missing the whole, now would be a great time to go sign up for all those extra episodes. Hole's always open in the expansion. Yes, and now main feed episodes are ad-free as well. Excellent, yes. Let's play a clip. All right, guys. And on the other side, we will get back to the rest of this episode. That's right. Here's a clip from the expansion. Access granted. My parents were in this horrific accident and barely survived it. My mother jumped into the open ocean at night in the middle of a storm. High waves and wind moved her away from the airplane remains quickly into what felt like total darkness. She was completely disoriented and alone. Out of nowhere, here comes this person swimming towards her and tells her, Follow me! Swim this way! My mother asks, Where's the raft? And he answers, The raft is this way! Follow me! She asked again, How do you know? And he answers, Trust me! Follow me! My mother followed him into what she said was pitch darkness, nothing to be seen or heard. After a few minutes, she told me she started hearing voices, people crying and yelling. And there, there's the raft. My mother asked this person, 
What is your name? He replied, They call me Toby. She thanked him, and that was the last time my mother saw Toby. After the rescue, my parents searched through the entire passenger list and found no one named Tobias or Toby. They asked everyone rescued if they knew of a Toby. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that clip. Become a member at beliefful.com. Appreciate your support. Well, I think it's about time for Jamie's story. Yeah, this is a great story. It's called Out of Body and Out of the Car. And this came to us from a listener last night as we were preparing for this episode. So it was perfect timing. And it just relates so well, especially to our, the author's experience. So let's take a listen. Hey, guys. I just heard your episode with Lamar and his OBE, and I wanted to tell you my story. So it was my sister, brother, and my two cousins, and we're all driving from Guymon, Oklahoma to Phoenix, Arizona for Thanksgiving to visit my dad. And it's like a 12-hour drive. We start, I think, when we all got off work at like 5, and so we're driving like through the night, and my sister's driving. I'm in the back seat with my cousins and I get this feeling that I need to get out of the car and like what I wanted to do was go into the desert and like be alone but I knew my sister wouldn't stop and let me because it's not a reasonable request and so I I rolled the window down a little bit I sat cross-legged and I let myself go I went out the window and up into the stars. And it was like, it was amazing. And I was there with some one, something. I don't know what to call it, but like the source. I'm not religious, but it wasn't like God. It didn't seem like the creator, but it seemed like it was another dimensional something. And it was there and communicating to me somehow that I was completely safe. And I just felt this warmth and overwhelming love, like I'm in the middle of a star. I've always been afraid of of astral projecting, thinking like my body's going to be alone, like what could get in, you know, those insidious movies. And I was connected the whole time. There was like a cord from my throat in the car up to me where I was. And... I don't know how long I was there, but my family started to notice. And I started to notice them noticing me. And they're shaking me, like shaking my body and saying my name, like, Jamie, come on, Jamie. Afraid of what, what's happening to me. I don't know what, you know what my body looks like, but I'm like in my head, like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Leave me alone. Let me stay. But I don't want to worry them. And so I go back into the car and I'm like, oh my gosh, guys. This is where I was. I told them what I was doing. I told them how I did it. I tried to get them to do it too. Nobody could do it. And there is something about this blue electric light. Like it was covering me like electricity, like hair standing up everywhere. And it was all over me. And it was like that feeling, that overwhelming feeling that I'm completely safe. And so I took it and I put it around the car and around each member of my family so that they're completely safe too. Oh man, and I got, it was cold is what I realized afterwards. I was shivering and let the window down to let the cold in. And so now, I don't know, I get the shivers and it feels like the source or whoever is communicating that to me. Like, I'm safe, I'm on the right path. Yeah. That was awesome. Great story. Really interesting story, man. Yeah. You can tell in her voice. I love the stories where they're just so... So excited. They, like they're reliving it. Yeah. That was a great story. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Interesting with the cord too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We talked silver about, cord, remember? Yeah. I wonder if her cord was silver. I know. We should ask her because it, it reminds me of uh, Lindbergh's account that we did for, I, forever ago now, but where he was in the airplane and had that out of body experience and had, saw the silver cord. Oh, he saw the silver cord? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh yeah. 
which is well, you hear a lot in out of body experiences or astral projection, I guess right. too. It's so funny. It's like tethered to a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, a bodyboard. It is a thing that seems to to hold people from actually leaving. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and I wonder if it is. Uh, so weird. If it's like a projection that makes sense as long as you have like an earthly kind of consciousness um, attached by a rope of some kind, you know? Yeah. Or if it is like there really is some sort of defined... You know, Robert Monroe talked about that too. The guy who did the um, binaural beats. Remember we did his book uh, a couple times? Oh, to initiate out of bodies. Yeah, but he experienced the silver cord phenomenon as well. Remember he kept uh, venturing further and further out through his wall. Yeah, we've had mm-hmm. some listeners... Listeners yeah, it's definitely too. not... I've heard it many, many times. Yeah. Even in the near-death experience stuff. I've been trying to decide of some artwork over my bed. I uh-huh. think that would be really cool to have like a dream oh, with yeah. a silver, silver cord. cord. That'd be yeah. awesome. You should just have an artist do you attached <laughs> to the silver. <laughs> That'd be a little too much. <laughs> it's like, that's me. You're like in a onesie. <laughs> it's like taking off in just space. Me- meditate on that <laughs> as you're sleeping. But yeah, again, the, those key points keep coming back. They relate to this phenomenon when it comes to like, obviously the, the leaving the body and that feeling of protection with that other aware, that other sentience there the protection the safety of the fatherly kind of you know paternal or whatever figure interesting yeah thank you so much for that jamie yeah Yeah. Um, i want can you still do it that's the question because she said she tried to teach her family and when she was in the car like this is how you do it weird about the the cold like shivering too i've never heard that that's something i've never heard before now i wasn't sure when i I listened to that again and i wasn't sure if she meant because she had had the window down the, I think she meant it reminds her of it. Cold because of that, so it reminds her of that source. That, oh, okay, yeah. But what was unique that I hadn't heard before? The blue light. The blue, it sounds kind of familiar, but yeah, the blue light of safety that she like then put around her family. Mm-hmm. And yeah, really interesting. There is some kind of uh, connection, I feel like, with blue light and life force. Mm-hmm. We just talked about like the blue, the, the, what was that? Oh, the Christmas lore. They were talking about when certain people would leave their body as like a, oh, yeah, a blue flame. Blue flame through the mouth. Yeah, and become like a, a dog or something that would. Haunt the streets. But and Spring Hill Jack. Of course. <laughs> it's blue fire. <laughs> throat fire. Um, anyways, yeah. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was fantastic. It, you know, yeah. it reminded me uh, of another story I came across on the Third Person Factor website. Third Man Factor. Uh, and this is a quick, sweet little anecdote, but also in a car. This one, a lot more freaky. This is called Auto Crash Walkin' from Eve Schofield. My sister was in a horrific car crash in 1979. She had to be lifted out of the car by the Jaws of Life tool and recalls a woman sitting in the car next to her, holding her hand, soothing her and telling her everything would be all right. My sister later died on the operating table and several times thereafter during her six week stay in intensive care, she recalls floating above the room and outside the hospital and seeing onion-like apparitions walking alongside people. There is a chapter written about her experience in Ruth Montgomery's book, Walk-Ins. Since then, she no longer fears death because she knows it is merely a transition. Onion-like apparitions. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. Like green onion or Vidalia? I'm thinking like, let maybe la- like layers? translucent layers of people. Or like an aura situation? Yeah, or maybe maybe versions of people or potential life paths, like the Donnie Darko kind of thing. Have you heard onion people in any of your studies, John? No. Near death experiences? <laughs> I think she's just yeah, saying I think like, like layers. layers. That yeah. makes more sense. Really interesting description though. Pretty intense. I think I have that book actually, Walk-Ins. All right. Well, there's one more story I wanted to do. And again, more adventure. This takes us to the wilds of New Zealand and the Grebe Valley. This I also found on the website of uh, John Geiger. This is called The Man in the Boat and comes from Jim Peacock. I was traveling in New Zealand in 1983 to 84, backpacking in many of their national parks and while in the Fjordland, NP. I was backpacking by myself in the Grebe Valley and caught in a flash flood that turned the valley into a lake overnight. I had to swim out through the trees for more than a half mile or so. Sounds intense. Yeah. (laughs) That's something you don't forget. Yeah. After sitting under a tree near my flooded tent waiting for the sun to come up for maybe six hours before I could begin this journey out, and then swimming through the forest for an hour or so, 
I don't really know how long much of this took. I had a stretch of maybe a hundred yards or so that had no trees. It was a field the day before and I had to swim it without stopping. About half the way across this field, I was caught in some vines and went under. I could not get out of the vines and after a struggle, I literally gave up. At this point, I saw my life pass before my eyes and witnessed the white light at the end of the tunnel. Then for some unknown reason, I was back at the surface and I saw a man in a boat nearby. I have always felt like it was Jesus, but until reading this book, I thought I was a bit crazy and never could really explain what I saw. I am convinced that this third man, or Jesus, or spirit, saved my life. I believe now this person helped me from drowning. At that time, he gave me a comforting feeling and confidence that I could do this. I swam across this field and rested by climbing up a tree. Finished swimming out through the woods, climbed up a very steep cliff and walked 15 miles out to Manawai village on a road that was washed out by the rains in many places. Some places I had to wade through mud up to my thighs. The mantra in my head was, don't deal with anything until it is right in front of you. I wonder now if that was put in my head by this third man. Regardless, the third man showed up when I needed him most. Thanks for writing this book. Few days go by when I don't think about the day when I nearly died and I saw this man in the boat who guided me to safety and saved my life. Man, that's a crazy story. Right. Even the visuals of like swimming through the forest. <laughs> yeah. That's so crazy, dude. A flooded park. Yeah. yeah. That would be one of those situations you just find yourself in. You're like, what the hell just happened? Is this a nightmare yeah. dream? You're not thinking that because it's, you're just dealing with that in the moment, but that is just such surreal. a strange, surreal. Yeah. Going to bed and then waking up just swimming through the forest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so crazy. But there it is again. What is the point? And that's the question too. Like if, if you imagine or hallucinate this kind of stuff, it's obviously, even if you want to make the claim that it's biologically, I don't even know. If you want to say like physiologically, we've developed this mechanism to project. Like a survival mechanism. Yeah, sort of thing. to project someone to give us encouragement because we're social creatures and we need someone to, it helps to have someone there to push right. you along. It, it's definitely possible. I just feel like, I don't know. It, then it goes back to like, what's the point of that? What's the point of uh, well, surviving survival. anyway? Yeah. yeah, I guess so you can procreate and make more hu- yeah, I mean, I, biological I, cells and humans. It just seems so kind of material to not have a purpose behind the even the reason to survive beside, other than reproduction yeah well it's yeah. like every animal yeah do you develop things over time to help you survive and it, it you know the social aspect's interesting because it is you know solitary confinement is like the most intense torture you can mm-hmm. inflict on someone right. and same with like you know whether you're in some solitude out in the arctic or you're a child who doesn't have any friends and you create again you create a third person as like an imaginary friend some people do just like some people I think they're are, seeing real people entities thank well, you that could be too we have talked about that that's very true. Real imaginary friends. The truth may be in between. That's right. There you go. Between and all around. Or in the hole. And inside you. Yeah, it's interesting. It's all very, very unprovable. <laughs> That's true. For now. Who knows what this, yeah, the scientific research they're doing. Uh, one person had a kind of interesting take, and we'll talk more about the possible explanations in the expansion, but in relationship to, even if it is a brain situation, like the physical, biological brain, and it is some sort of trigger or switch, like the angel switch that we'll talk about later from Geiger. But um, one hiker who had this experience said what he thought it might be was, because he said, like it, he said it felt like it was from within, not from out, but he thought that it isn't something that your brain just creates, but it allows you an extrasensory perception to contact a collective human consciousness so that you can draw on people who are real, who exist, who live in your life, and actually kind of bring them to you to help you out in an, or be it's some sort of mirror or something. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. We'll talk about, we'll explore that more in the expansion, but yeah, who knows? There's so many different possibilities. Even the pale chubby warehouse worker floating yeah, shirtless on the air mat next to that kid who was, uh, he rescued. Brought him to shore. As like a, you know, middle-aged angel man. There's also a possibility that someone who died 
in the surf who's obviously not a normal beach goer, wasn't prepared, died on an air mat. Now he uses that air, air mat spiritually for a time. And so he <laughs> moves on to rest like the, tra- you know. Well, it's like we talked about with uh, Hansi's story with the skateboard. Like, right. was that apparition of a homeless man? Was he someone that maybe died on that corner and just once in a while will stop that from happening again? Helping some people out before, yeah. he, before he goes on to the, the great oneness in the, uh, in the space. Oh, and that story of Jamie again. So we, I just sent you that near-death experience video that you had already seen that story, but it was the guy who basically went off to space like Lamar, a space-type yeah. uh, reality with just like pure love and everything you want to feel as a human being mm-hmm. and not wanting to go back. And uh, it's just, it's weird how these, can, even if it's OBE or whatever, there's like this feeling of just, once you're out of body, you connect to something greater. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you're, you've left the prison mm-hmm. and you're floating free. It's nice to look forward to that. Yeah. Instead of It'll all happen one day. <laughs> I know. We'll all find out someday. And we'll float around together, just above the hole. But that time is not yet. It's a weird visual. That time is not yet. We have more shows to do. More stories <laughs> to tell. A thousand more episodes waiting. <laughs> so I hope you guys dug this one. We had a lot of fun researching it. Yeah. Uplifting adventure for the new year. For the new you. Yeah. Hope you guys have a great new year. Yeah. We're excited for season six to start mm-hmm. in February. Yep. Yes. And we will miss you, but we will be back. That's right. Bigger and better. And if you're still here and you're not signed up for the expansion, go do it. That's right. Oh, I should say, if you haven't heard your name yet on the show. Yes. We're still getting through them. But also, coming. if you signed up a long time ago, let us know too, because every once in a while people do slip through the cracks and it's definitely yeah. not intentional. No, it's a hacked system of multiple... Since systems don't work well together, we had to build something that will send you our names. Send... Are us your names is how that works. And uh, sometimes it sends them incorrectly or whatever. So if you've got missed, reach out, let us know, we'll verify it, and uh, you will be heard. Also, if you increased your tier level because you wanted your name heard, we don't always get notifications on someone who's been in the expansion and then increases their tier. So right. definitely get hold of us. Speaking of super awesome people, we have some special people yeah. to thank. One more thing, though. We are hopefully soon, sometime soon in the new year after season six starts. We are definitely trying to get Discord up and running, and that will yeah. be one of the other tier perks, which should be really cool. I'm excited for that. Absolutely. We got one of our friends working on it who happened to have uh, a baby mm-hmm. a couple, couple months ago, and I think he was helping us with it, but he got super busy, obviously. Uncle Slammer. But hopefully, yeah, he will be able to help us finish that when he's ready. So Absolutely. look forward to that. Papa Slammer. <laughs> Papa Slammer. <laughs> All right, guys. Sweet. All right, and a special shout out to Joe Short and family. Oh, yes. From Shorts Brewery in Michigan. Sweet, sweet gentleman sent us a package of multiple cases of delicious beer. Oh, so good. And uh, yummy treats. Unexpected, but very appreciated. Yes, it was a fantastic care package. A little Christmas kindness. It touched my heart. And actually, he might, we might be spending night, potentially. I'm going to talk to more about it, but if you guys remember, we did an episode on haunted lighthouses, and we covered one specific lighthouse that we might have an opportunity to stay in. Oh, that'd be awesome. he knows a maintenance guy. Oh, thank you to Elmer. Awesome. Drew's his killer drawings if you're watching on youtube you can see these beautiful representations <laughs> they're awesome yeah. my favorite thing is the giant seems like a loud fella and everybody else who sent stuff we don't have time to thank everybody unfortunately but yeah. all the authors all the artists people who sent us christmas cards thank you so much we really appreciate it yeah there was a ton of people and it was really special to get all those things from you so we read everything together and we just really appreciated all the messages we had a little blue hole christmas so thank you guys shout for out sure. to the, the uh, gutter condo for organizing the christmas card exchange <laughs> <laughs> All right, and for the rest of the special people to thank today, Black Eyed Cool Kids Tear and Up. All right, welcome to Patrick Lewis, a shadow person of interest. Hi, Patrick. Keep it coming, brother. Thanks for that generosity, man. That's super awesome. Appreciate it. Um, along comes a boy, David Roy. What a guy. <laughs> along comes a boy. David welcome. Roy. Probably a man, but we it rhymed. Thank you, David. Welcome to be here. Welcome to be here. Yes. yes. Uh, Cindy D is a Black Eyed Cool Kid. Hello. All right. Cindy, welcome to be here. Thanks for joining. Better answer the door when she comes. Or not, I guess. Oh, Black Eyed Cool Kid. Okay. Didn't understand that. Thank you so much. Yes. You're so happy to have you in the hole. Lara La La Mac. All right. Hey, we're going to La La's tonight That's for Mom's right. birthday. What a synchronicity. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura, for being a dog man whisperer. Yes. You were awesome. Yes. Ruby Tuesday. Oh, Great Good song. restaurant. Mm. Song or restaurant. Sure. They did have a typhoon shrimp. Welcome to be here, Ruby yes. Tuesday. Ruby. Love ya. Yes. Great name. Joshua Martin. Hi. Hey, buddy. Hey. Dog man whisperer. All right. Nice. Good job. 
followed quickly by a shadow person of interest. Another yes. one. Awesome. Thank you. Generosity from you. MJ Morris. Oh, super MJ. special. I just watched Air Jordan last night. Is it good? It was awesome. Yeah, cool. There's was, was a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with Matt, Matt uh, Dam- Damlin. That's not important, but uh, just MJ, you know? MJ, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Initials. Think of Michael Jackson. Triggered it. Catch some air. Thanks, MJ Morris. You freaking rule. Gregory... Nissen. Nissen. Ooh. Sounds Norwegian, maybe. Liam? Another shadow person of interest. Yes. Oh, man. You guys. Here of the whole. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Gregory. Good to good news. Uh, Cass Renshaw is here. Welcome to be here, Cash Renshaw. Thank you. Cash money. Great villain name. Uh, thank you to have us in the hole, Blaine McCubbins. All right. McCubbins for three. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome in. From downtown. Yes. Clint Oxtolis. Oh. That sounds very familiar. Greek. I think I had an argument about his name. It was Greek or not. That or another Oxtolis. That's true. Welcome yeah. in. But now he's a shadow person of interest. So that's, ah. that, that needs to be thanked again. Yes. Thank you, thank sir. Thank you for that generosity. Clint the Stint. Clint the Clint. Stint. In my heart. In my heart. The Stint in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> sounds painful, but they're helpful. Thank you for your stint, Clint. Uh, Elizabeth Marshall Smith is a Dogman Whisperer. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Lizzie Liz. Come on down, you furry friend. Yes. Another shadow person of interest, Joshua Covert. Ooh. Covert Ops. Yeah, keeping them a secret. Excellent. Thank you, Joshua. Thank Thanks, you for Josh. being a shadow person. Welcome man. to be here. Yes. Donnie Madden. Hi. Ooh. From downtown. Donnie Madden it up. He's on fire. Wait, is that Madden? Madden football. We've done this before. Yeah, yes. that was a basketball game. Though. Yes. Beastly chest. Holy <laughs> man. <laughs> Holy man. <laughs> I'm intimidated now. Harry man. Uh, thank Welcome you. in, Beastly. Thankly, thankly Beastly. Thank you. Uh, Chris Stanfill is here. Stanfill? Stand on the landfill. Stanfill. No, mm-hmm. stand on the landfill, Stan. Phil? Yes. Wow. It's a clean man. Well, thank you for being here, Seriously, Stan. Thank you, Chris Stanfill. Stanfill. <laughs> Can't think of anything better to say, but you're great. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, Lord Jake Thompson. Lord Jake. Lord Jake, hesitation for climactic value. Thompson. Is he really a lord? We should ask. It's a good title. He might own one of those Scottish pots yes. he can sell. You are good in my book because my dog is Jake. <laughs> And I appreciate you. Yeah, and he's a dogman whisperer, so. Yes, your works out. Works on all levels. Thank you, Lord King Jake. Yay! Anne Bunston is a dogman whisperer. Anne Bunston. Bunston Burner. <gasps> That's a friendly name. Ooh, Bunston, good call out, John. <laughs> Bunston Burner. Yes. I love those. Close. Thank you, Anne. We appreciate that. Uh, Chelsea Jones, hi. Welcome to be here. Hi, hi. You know, a friend of the show. I did chill in named Chelsea and the accident killed her. We don't have to go into what happened to Chelsea. Chelsea Jones comes in droves. Off run, yeah. but yes. <laughs> bad, bad news. Bad, bad. <laughs> like a whip sound effect. <laughs> Make a bad joke. <laughs> bad boy. Welcome in, Chels. Uh Chris Dougherty mm. is arrived in the hole. Next week on Dougherty Abbey. A singer? Never mind. Are you a singer, Chris? No. John wants to know. <laughs> no, he was like, a, never mind. Just shut, oh, sh- yeah, the, shut uh, up my brain. That song? Chris Isaac. Chris Dougherty was like a, a singer for like American Idol or something. Oh, okay. I mean, it's him. He <laughs> became like super famous. Anyways, who gives it? It could be him. Who gives a crud? Thanks for giving American Idol for us, Chris. Welcome to be here. Travis Curry. Ooh, is yum, yum. Curry Make, it up. Making it delicious. Yum, yum. Curry so good. Food. <laughs> yum, yum. Curry, <laughs> curry so, so good. good. <laughs> curry so good. Welcome, uh, Travis Curry. Yes. Welcome, yes. Travis. We're happy to have you. Yes. Noah Ooh. is uh, building his ark, and yes. he is parking it right in the belief hole. Could be a girl. Noah? Could be. I do know a Noah. You know a Noah girl? I know a Noah really? girl. I know a Noah girl. I'm going with the oldest Noah I know. Which is definitely a dude. Uh, Melanie nu- Nunez. Nunez. Oh, yes. A no. dogman whisperer. Howling deep in our hole. Just like that. Love those melons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Followed by another dogman whisperer scratching at the door. We have Kevin H. Knuth. Who? Excuse me? Knuth. Knuth. God bless you. K N U D H. It could be silent K. It could be Knuth. Nuth? I like it. It's nothing but trouble, I'll tell you that. Ooh. He's a troublemaker. Kevin, welcome in, my friend. We are happy to have you, Dogman Whisper, friend of us. Mr. TV. Yes. Mr. TV. AKA Edgar R. <laughs> is also in the whole I cryptic. Want my MTV. That's such a good song, dude. It is. Just think about that. Who was that? I want. Dire Straits? I want. Oh, is that it? No. Okay, it was in the movie. La- it was in the Jordan movie last night. Oh, it's uh, Don Henley, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's Don Henley. I think so. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to the whole another Black Eyed Cool Kid, Cody Zykel. 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 Yeah, probably, that's probably right. Cody. Cody Zykel. She looks like a wonderful lady. Thank you, Cody. Thank you to be here, Cody. Sweetheart of the whole. Was Dire Straits, by the way. It was. You're right. Money for nothing. Money for nothing. Sorry. Uh, Marina Vonk. Yes. Is here. Oh my gosh, Vonk. 
Yes, John is excited about that. <laughs> I don't even that. know what to... Marina Vox sounds like a Russian spy. Yeah, definitely. It? Welcome. It sounds like an heiress. Yeah. To some sort of... Definitely. Definitely a rich heiress. Marina Vonk has entered the room. She's approaching the podium. Thank you for using your inheritance on the whole. Yes, thank you so much, Marina. Yes! Great name. Desiree Pollock. My favorite fish, by the way. Yeah. They used it in imitation crab. My favorite slur. Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> we all we'll know where that got us last time. Yeah. <laughs> we can't joke about... We get a hate mail for Pollock. <laughs> Pollock representation. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Stupid. We're not racist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Desiree. That's a beautiful name, by the way. Uh, Kobe King. All right. Crowned in the hole. Yes. King of the hole? King of the copes. Yes. King of the hole. Lord of the manor. Lazarus Bohe is a dogman whisperer. Nice. <laughs> Risen from the dead. Yeah. The Lazarus effect. <laughs> yes. That's, that's a movie name. That's his movie name. Good for me. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> good for me. Good for you. Lazarus, thank you. Yes. Yes. Great man. Dogman Whisperer. You got a real Think Boy over here. Think Boy? What is that? <laughs> you ever heard of a Think Boy? Is that like just like a smart ass or something? No, it's just someone who likes to, yeah, like, oh. likes to say that is so dumb. intellectual things. It just reminds me of what you'd call a smart person at like a tech startup. It's someone who like challenges, likes to challenge things think and be boy. like, oh. yeah, it's a funny slur. It's like though. a condescending, yeah. right? Okay. Got we a got think a real boy Think Boy over here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Federal Reserve, but they print money and. Got a real Think Boy over here. He's got thoughts and stuff. Mm. All right. Truman Childs is here. Ooh. A dogman whisperer. Welcome. Welcome. Truman yeah. Childs. Do you have any Childs? That's another heir to the kingdom sounding name. Heir to the, the fortunes. Truman Childs will be marrying Mrs. Marina Vonk. Yeah, definitely a royal sounding name. He's from name. the Childs family. Thank you, Truman. Yes. Thank you, Truman. You are real. Dogman whisperer. Susan Cobb can provide all the corn. Corn in the hole. For the belief hole. A lot of corn today. Corn in the hole. Corn hole. <laughs> there we go. Yes. Put words together. Corn hole. Uh, thank yes. you so much, Susan Cobb. We appreciate the support. It's weird. I get nervous for this. <laughs> just like trying More to than on the spot. Yeah. There's just something about it. Like, I just feel like we get worse and worse over As time. We go, yeah. yeah. Well, then the music too, it's like you, you feel like there's a timer going. And we obviously like, are, it's so hard to keep track of all this stuff and we just suck at it now. Yeah. And I just get real uptight about trying to say anything good. It's, it's stressful. Because there's so many names, it's hard to like, if it was relaxed, it'd be a lot more easy to do it. We always like, want to come up with something clever. And, yeah. We're, we're trying to catch up and at the same time be quick as, as tough. Yeah. And we suck. And we suck. We're terrible people. I like me. I mean, I love me, but... Anyways, Joyce Vanet or Joyce Bennett. Yes. Welcome to be here. Thank you, Joyce. I rejoice for you. Joyce Bennett, be my Bennett. Nope. Uh, he's no snake. Robin Blake is here. Yes! Slithering in the grass. Well, he's not a snake. He's uh, flying in the sky as a uh, dogman whisperer. Flying high in the sky. Maybe he's a dogman with wings. I think he's a dogman with wings. Yes. We're happy to have you, Robin. I said Robin. Could be a girl. Are there any canines that fly? <laughs> I actually thought about that for a second. I did too. <laughs> well, now you've considered the Australian Hooba Blot. It's probably called like something like the Dog Bat <laughs> the or Australian something. Australian Hooba Blot. <laughs> Sorry, Robin. If Flacco density, concrete <laughs> secretion. What is it? Uh, Lemonite concretion. <laughs> That's a throwback. Oh man. Uh, uh, Robin Blake, by the way, might be a lady. We were saying guy, but Robin, like uh, either way, you're a hero to me. Yes, sidekick. Side, well, like Robin and, and Batman. A, a regular support in the hole. She's Constant. She's Constance Bryant. Yes. A dogman whisperer. I love that name. Constance. Yeah, you just feel like you can depend on that person. Constant, constantly. Beautiful. I imagine she's going to be a member forever. A thorn in the side of evil and all do-batters out there. Thorn Russell is a shadow person of interest. Nice. <gasps> Fighting for her. Thorn Russell. That's a yes. great name. That you great? don't want to tussle with a Thorn Russell. Yeah. That is an actor's name for sure. Thorn Russell. <laughs> that sounds like a porn actor. From like the, old oh, days of like, the old days of like <laughs> British. Either. I think like an old James Bond actor. Yeah. Yeah. Thorn Russell. Thorn Russell. Dude, how are you not a movie star? Seriously. I wish I had to name that. Are cool. you a movie star? Movie movie star? Movie. Are you a movie, <laughs> movie star? Are you a blockbuster? <laughs> You're They're all gone. Stuff. It's sad. Oh. Anyway, man, our brains are going crazy places. Thank you, Thorn. Thanks for being a shadow person. That's seriously a killer. John Sykes, dogman whisperer of interest. Sykes it up. Sykes it up. Thank you for your furry support, my friend. Psyched for you. Uh, Wendy Zapfa. Zapfa? Z-A-P-F-E. Zapfa. Zapfa. I like it. Are we pronouncing it correctly? I don't know. You can bite our faces off. Because you're a dogman person of interest. is not a thing. You're a dogman whisperer. What's it, Wendy? Wendy oh, Zapfa. Great restaurant. Sandwich. Nice, Chris. Nice association God, there. that's w almost worse than anything. Great I've ever restaurant. Said. <laughs> you think Great sandwich. Not even the right name. It's oh, what? Square Burgers. Square yeah. Patties. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, <laughs> Oogly Booblies <laughs> is here. Yes. You think that's the real name? 
Probably. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I knew one in high school. Oogly Boogly. He was I'm, a basketball player. I'm going to guess it's a... It's, it's very a, common in Germany. It's like, what was the basketball player that had the silly name? Uh, Coco Crisp or no, Martin Bradley? That's baseball. No, wasn't there one that was like... Oh, Spud Webb? <laughs> Muggsy Bogues? <laughs> <laughs> no, on the Cavs. Chris uh, literally just clapped his hands. I did. <laughs> what was the ca- on the Cavs years ago when they were doing well? Uh, oh, Booby. 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 Booby something. I, I don't was, think I was saying. He was saying. LeBron's like secondhand man. I, I thought he was like a football. Like a no, br- Booby br- McBoob or something. I don't remember. Booby, Booby something. Oh, anyways. We're, we're sports people. <laughs> uh, anyways, thank you, Oogly Boobies. I think she, I think it might be uh, Kayla. That's great. But you were a sweetheart. Shadow person interest. Heck yeah. Uh, Katie is a dogman whisperer. What's up, Katie? Oh. Nice. Classic name. Thank you for coming in with the furry fire. We have two cousins named Katie. I need to practice some better responses, I feel like. Yeah. Improv classes. Uh, Joseph... Cabin. Yes. Or Caban. Ooh, yes. I like that. Joseph. Yes. Joseph Cat Cabin. Cabin? Cat C A B A N. Caban. Mm. Cool. Love if you break Caban. down every name because I like that. Yeah. So many interesting names out there. It's I so know. funny because we start off, we're like, we're gonna get through them quickly, and then by the end of it, we're <laughs> spending like, 30 seconds on every just name. Have a good time with them, you know? <laughs> thank you, Joseph. I love your name. That is all. Okay, thank you to another dogman whisperer. She put in her email as her name, which I won't read because it's probably private. Uh, but Jacqueline. 88. Nice. I'll say that. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for being a Dogman Whisperer. Yes. What a, what a sweet lady. We appreciate you very much. Another Dogman Whisperer in the hole. Uh, by gosh, it's Josh. Josh B. <laughs> it's so lame. I cannot think of better things to say anymore. That was good. It was a very Norman yes. Donaldy. <laughs> by gosh, it's yes. Josh. Thank you, Josh. You're amazing. Mm. Seriously. Uh, Wendy Knight is a oh, right. is yes. knighted in the hole. Yes. A Sir Wendy Knight. Whole royalty. From the lady, Wendy Knight. Knight of my life. Knight of my life. I'm having the night of my life. Anyway. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> this is a bad attempt at that song. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, Square sandwich. Benjamin Souther is here. Hi, come on down to the hole. Welcome to be here, Benjamin. Yes. Nice. Souther. Souther. Uh, hi in from the hole from us to you, uh, w- <laughs> Wendelin Andes. Ha, hi in the hole from us to you. <laughs> My mouth is falling are apart. You, are you channeling? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Bashir. Bashir over here. Bashir. Wendelin Andes. Hi in the hole over us to you. Welcome. Wen- Wendelin. Wendelin. Wendelin that Andes. Is an awesome name. That I've is... never heard of Wendelin before. It's seriously cool. I'm climbing those mountains, I'll tell you what. Um, there was a. <laughs> doesn't sound right. Andes. Yeah. Gwendolyn. I knew Gwendolyn. You're climbing her mountains. Okay. Yeah. Not her mountains. Just the, mountains. the name. Andes. Gwendolyn. Yes. Gwendolyn Mountains. You know what it is. Gwendolyn Paltro. Worth the rhyme. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Anyways. Yes. That is seriously a cool name. Uh, Wyatt Bauman. Yes. Oh, hello. Oh, hello, Welcome Wyatt. Welcome to be here, my friend. Pull that gun. Skin that smoke wagon. Sure. Uh, Sam Winters, hi. Come on down to the hole. We're happy to have you. Yes, yes, thank you, Sam. Uh, the water is warm for Jenny Rabin. Hi. All right. Dogman Whisperer. Cool. Ready for some Rabin stew? She's rabid yes. as a Dogman Whisperer. Yes. Jenny is. Thank you for being here. Another Dogman Whisperer that is barking in our faces, I guess. Uh, Rainy Becker. Oh, nice. A beautiful storm she is. Yes. Yes. Welcome in. Uh, ooh, this is a beautiful name. Jerry Cost. Jerry. Oh, it's spelled two different ways. Yes. J H E R I and then J E R R Y. Yes. So welcome question. in. Welcome to be here. Welcome to be here. Ryan is our guest. He is Ryan Guest. Yes, nice. yes, yes. Short, sweet. <laughs> Seventh guest. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> welcome to be here, my friend. Uh, Taylor Stokes is here. Stokes! Stoked for that. Tay Tay. Yes. Hey, hey. Welcome to be yes. here. Taylor? Taylor. Taylor. Love that name. Taylor Stokes. Sputimus. Build me a suit. What? I don't even get that. Ben Tut! King of the hole. That's how you stop an elephant. Did you know that, John? If you're ever being charged, okay, that will work. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you for being here, Brian Lamoureux. Beautiful. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't We're to really say running out yeah, of ways to say. Reminded me of like uh, someone I'd meet down a dark alley in New Orleans. So thank you for being here, uh, Cora Weber. Ooh, Cora. That's a, that is a beautiful. Yes. Name. Down Abbey. Thank you, Cora. Thank you to be here. Thank you to be here, Liam Stairkiller. No, yes. yes. Liam Stair Stairiker. Yes. Stairiker. Stairiker. Mm. Not Stairkiller. That's hysterical. Liam. Thank Liam. you, my friend. That's a great name too. too. I would consider that for a son. That's name. good name. Oasis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael Pop Popa. Popa. <laughs> Did I say that right? Popa. Popa. I'm gonna be a porpoise when I said that. Michael Popa. P O P P A. Ovary porpoise. Could be Papa. Popa. Anyways, we yes. are happy to have you, my friend, and thank you for being in the hole. We're almost at a, the very end of the music. Okay, okay. Uh, in fast succession here, we have 
Nelly Santana. Oh, welcome to be here, Nelly. Nelly, thank you for being here. Play us a little riff. We love you, Nelly. Shayla R., thank you for joining the hole at the $10. Joining. Joining, joining the hole at the $10. What is that? You don't know what that is. I don't Dogman know Whisperer. Thank you, Dogman Whisperer. Chris doesn't do the name, really. Shayla? We're so close. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, he is not dull. He is Dylan Sharp. Ow! Ah! Ouchie. Ouchie McGouchie, as dad would say. Ah! Looking good in that sharp Caramba. suit. Caramba. Caramba. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Thank you for being here. And thank you to all thank you members in the whole yes. with us. You support us. You keep us going and growing. You're our freaking heroes. You do us. You do us well. We do you. Thank you for supporting us this season. Yes. It was a fantastic ride. We are unfortunately canceling the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks that. for tuning in. Surprise. Just kidding. Bad, bad. Well, have three members that like just immediately close their laptops and they never check. Slam it's it like, shut. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, I thought I was... I thought they were done. I thought they were, I thought they were gone forever. I think we should do that at some point is have like a big problem, cancel the show, and then create like a big upswell where like there's talk that we're going to start again. That's and it. Then We've got enough to do. Have like a big <laughs> comeback. Starting a fake death. I just death. want to have a comeback in my life at some point. But in order to have a comeback, you have to stop it. Let's you know? not hope for com- needing comebacks. Yeah. Anyways, we will be back in season six, guys. Yeah, it's going to be an incredible season oh, full yeah. of original, unusual, and new concepts for the show. We're going to yeah. freshen it up a little bit with some adventures. Oh, some amazing stories. Yeah. And, uh, we're going to d- do some deep dives, some great storytelling. Of course, the usual incredible, bizarre stories we have from listeners. And strange everything. listeners. Strange listeners. Some strange listeners. Strange <laughs> listeners. We do have strange, strange listeners listen. and their stories. Stories from strange listeners. <laughs> Just we kidding. Some, we have a lot of killer stories that have been coming in recently, guys. So yeah. feel free to keep sending those, especially speak pipes. Yeah. We love them. And we're, we're hoping to maybe start working on a book in season six. Yeah. Going to take some time. But, and audio book. Yep. So that's hopefully something to look forward to. So yeah. Yeah. It's Hopefully gonna be great. expanding some in some new and f- interesting ways. Absolutely. Um, hope you guys enjoyed the episode. The third man factor uh, loved researching this episode with the the polar adventures and the expansion. If you guys haven't heard the expansion, I think it, honestly, and I'm not saying this to get anyone to sign up who hasn't, but I think it was even better. I think the stories. I think I, we had more time to get into like the feeling of the atmosphere and yeah, the, just the feeling of adventure and talk about Shackleton more. So definitely check that out. There's a bit more creep in that one, I feel like, too. There's some creepy stories with the Antarctica base. And just the Ginny being frozen with the... Oh, the ship, the yeah. ghost ship Ginny. Yeah, anyways, it's great stuff in there, along with some Ninja Turtle nostalgia, which is fun. We had a lot of fun in that episode. Yeah, it was a good time. Yeah. So we'll see you guys there uh, if you haven't heard it yet. And uh, otherwise, we will we'll touch base over the break, and uh, we will see you for season six. Yeah, see you next time on, on Belief Hole. Hole.